Good evening and welcome to Let's Talk Art from the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. I'd like to remind you that this is a recorded webinar. If you have questions or comments throughout the discussion, just please drop them in the comment section or the Q&A and our panelists will check them out. I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Hall, director, and Daniel Falco, curator. Welcome. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to make a few welcome remarks. I think um, people are still trickling on at our very prompt six o'clock start. So um, I usually begin with a little bit of a commercial for activities at the museum. And I will remind everyone that we have a really fun family activity launching this weekend on Saturday. It's our gingerbread house day and you can go on our website to get the link. Um, you will be see the list of supplies you need to make a um, graham cracker gingerbread house and you can do that with any of the young people in your family and also hear um, the gingerbread baby the jan brett story being read so um, that's a recorded um, event that you can access at any time but we're premiering it on saturday we also have um, tonight's event when we do these we set them up as webinars because um, you know you never know how many people are going to log on and it just gives us a little more control but we intend them to be friendly and informal so um, there'll be conversation back and forth between me and Daniel I may interrupt him he may interrupt me and I encourage you to go ahead and type questions in the chat box or and there's a Q&A box as well and Jillian and Kelly are here to monitor that chat in case we're um, too, too busy to be distracted by it. And they will actually interrupt with questions if they seem to be relevant to what we're talking about at the time. I think it's nice to talk about things in context when you can. Um, so that's the format of tonight. Um, Daniel and I are gonna do another Let's Talk Art on January 19th, which is gonna kind of celebrate the closing of this exhibition. And we're calling that a Zoom Salon, um, talking about prints. We have a number of folks in the community who wrote um, labels for the exhibition. We call it the Visiting Voices Project. And we invited people with different perspectives in to write a sort of personal response to some of the artwork in the show. And so we're going to have those voices join us on the next Let's, Let's Talk Art um, for a sort of broader conversation. And Daniel's going to give, um, if you really want, a sort of more academic, scholarly kind of lecture experience. Daniel is going to do that the week of January 3rd, um, either January 6th or 7th. We don't have a specific date set for that yet, but um, you can also um, get your exhibition information that way. So it's a lot of slides. Um, we try and keep our eye on the clock and we go into warp speed when we need to, um, to get to all the things we want to share with you. Um, we're going to take a virtual trip to the Netherlands and full disclosure, um, neither of us have been there. <laughs> I've been as, I've been within a couple hundred miles, 126 miles, I think, of Amsterdam, I checked. Um, but I have not been to Holland and neither has Daniel. So a, a research and uh, following the trail of Rembrandt and following the trail of uh, William and, um, and uh, Anna Singer has led us to create this sort of travelogue for you. Um, so I'm gonna let Daniel share his screen and start the slides and we will go on a little trip. Here we go. And some of the places we're going to be looking at tonight are uh, Leiden and Amsterdam, and then we're going to circle around to Lauren, which connects to the founders of our museum, William and Anna Singer. And there's a portrait of Rembrandt, who is going to help us be one of our uh, guides, so to speak, through this presentation. And we've decided to organize this because we have a special exhibition that's on view at the museum right now, and it's called the Dutch Golden Age prints by Rembrandt and his contemporaries. And if you're in the area, we certainly encourage you to visit the exhibition, which runs through January 24th next year. It's organized and circulated by the Reading Public Museum in Pennsylvania. And it features works, wonderful prints by Rembrandt and his contemporaries. We have a selection here. Just to show you some of the highlights from it, Rembrandt's Dr. Faustus, which is really a fabulous etching and engraving, showing his signature use of the contrast of light and dark and then another one of our favorites, The Annunciation to the Shepherds from 1632, which is really a special print, beautifully done. In the time period that we're gonna be referring to it many times for 
at least the first part of the presentation, is the Dutch Golden Age. And that's a period that runs from the late 16th century through the mid 17th century. It's when Holland, uh, or otherwise known as the Dutch Republic, reaches its height of prosperity and power politically and economically. I'll interrupt and actually really dug into the Golden Age um, the last month, and you can find um, the links to our prior discussions on um, our Facebook page, on our website, and also on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch that one if you want to know more about the Dutch Golden Age in general. Yes, absolutely. And I'll also be talking about it more in my uh, lecture that I give in January. So the, the, you can see more about that, but the, this, this exhibition marks a wonderful occasion for this. And then the cities that we're going to be looking at tonight in conjunction with this are here. Here's Leiden, and then there's Amsterdam, and then where the singers lived is very close to Amsterdam, right about there, a place called Lauren, which is a suburb of Amsterdam. And this prosperity of the Dutch Republic we were referring to was uh, really built on the heels of this extensive maritime empire. That's why I brought in a Dutch seascape here. They were amazing mariners and traders, the Dutch. And we begin our uh, exploration of these cities, the Dutch culture uh, with uh, Leiden. And just to show you a couple of uh, spots of sites, we have the Kornbrug or the Corn Bridge that's here. You also have the Hoglandse Kerk that's here. And then the town hall, which is right about here. And many of these towns, as you'll see, they're organized around rivers. In this case, Leiden is the hometown of Rembrandt. And that's why his last name is Rembrandt von Rhein, because he was Rembrandt of the Rhine River. He grew up right on the river. And you have the confluence of these canals and rivers with small harbors. And this plays a really crucial role in the Dutch economy and way of life, even today. Sorry, Daniel, I found the McDonald's of Leiden extremely amusing as I'm trying to put my head into Rembrandt's life. <laughs> yes, exactly. Leiden being much different than back at that time. And uh, back when Rembrandt lived in Leiden, it was quickly becoming a uh, center of the textile industry. So it was really booming. It was flourishing. Also, uh, it's a university town, correct? Yes, it is. It has one of the oldest universities in um, Europe among them, and certainly in Holland. And these are some of the main attractions. You have the Herengracht, which is this very stately uh, canal with these wonderful houses, Holland being known for these kinds of very narrow facades. And then, of course, here's the Hoglandse Kerk, which is a uh, 15th century Lake Gothic church. And then you have a view of the town hall here with the uh, Kornbrug or Corn Bridge. So it's very much a life on, on, on water, uh, so to speak. And this is where Rembrandt gets his start. This is one of his early paintings called The Stunning of St. Stephen, a very um, dire subject in terms of the death of this martyr. And then there's a print from later in his career that's represented in the exhibition, but it's here and there's a self-portrait of the artist within this painting. He is right there. He, put, he inserts himself and you're gonna see how he does that in a couple of other paintings tonight. But um, just want to uh, show this to you because it is represented in the exhibition that he explores not only in painting, but in prints. Take a, take a moment to talk about Rembrandt and self-portraiture. I think it's, it's worth a, worth a yeah. minute. Yeah, Rembrandt um, is really a, an outstanding uh, artist uh, who explored self-portraiture. It's how he looked at his inner psyche. It's how he explored his emotions. And it's through this kind of composition that we really sort of get to know what kind of person he was, how he fashioned himself, how he viewed himself. And at this stage, he's certainly a bit more timid. You're going to see when we get to some slides later on that uh, he's much more uh, self-confident. But here he's sort of in the background. He's in the shadows, which tended sometime to, sometimes to be, at least since the Renaissance, um, artists would sometimes hide themselves in the composition. But as he uh, becomes more successful and established, that's uh, going to change a bit. But it's one of his most amazing and strong parts of his entire work. This is in light in the, the famous Renaissance uh, City Hall. And Leiden is not just famous for artists as Rembrandt, but also Jan van Goyen, uh, who was a famous Dutch landscapist. He is from there too. Garrett Dow, who uh, is here representing himself in a self-portrait in his studio. And then also uh, the great 
Dutch artist of interiors, Gabriel Metsu, a um, man writing a letter from 1665. I'll interrupt yes. for a moment too to say sure. when, when Daniel is showing examples of um, some of these genre paintings, um, pay attention to the interior details because you will see them when we visit Rembrandt's house later. And that's, I think, one of the fascinations with this period in Holland is they just left us so much imagery. They left us so much visual documentation of the way they lived, and we and people have remained fascinated with it, you know, ever since. Yes, absolutely. And paintings like this represent their, in many cases, their daily activities. And these paintings were commissioned many times as cabinet pictures and would have been displayed within their homes, like you see here with Jan Steen um, in his fantasy interior. And uh, this is really a quintessentially uh, Dutch Golden Age painting. And feel free to jump in here, Sarah, but you sort of have it all in a picture like this. Um, you've got these uh, increasingly wealthy Dutch burghers here enjoying music. They're sort of in, uh, also having leisure. But amidst all this, you can see there's a skull on the mantelpiece here that reminds us of the transients of material objects and the existence of humans. I think, I think it's in Simon's book, um, The Embarrassment of Riches, where, and, and I'm sure other people have talked about this as well, the Dutch, you know, they're so prosperous, that, you know, at this time period, there's a lot of material comfort, but there's a lot of self-consciousness and discomfort associated with that, you know, the Protestant Reformation and Calvinism, um, this sense of discipline and Protestant work ethic um, informing the way they live their lives. So there's always this sense that it could all vanish in any moment. And of course, um, this particular painting um, sort of is, is a bit of an allegory about that, about how all of this prosperity is really um, precariously balanced. Yes, absolutely. And then you even get a reference to the contemporary Dutch colonial empire, built, of course, in many regards on slave labor. And we see this um, uh, black man who's done on the lower left here, who is uh, incorporated in here is a reference to that. The Dutch Empire reaches many different parts of the world. And from there, we're going to move, follow Rembrandt's um, path. After he leaves Leiden, he will move to Amsterdam and establish himself there. So and, I'm Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt and read a quote here. This is an excerpt from a uh, book by François Fénelon, The Adventures of Telemachus, um, published in 1699. Um, Rembrandt was born in 1606, so roughly of the period. And he's writing about Phoenicia, fictionally, um, the Phoenician Empire. Um, but he's taking contemporary Amsterdam as his model. Um, and I, I'm using um, the great scholar of Dutch graphic art, Fritz Lucht, um, has a book, Amsterdam and Amsterdam and Rembrandt, Rembrandt in Amsterdam, I think is really the title. And this is really the beginning of that. And it is a wonderful evocation of Amsterdam. The city seems to float upon the waters and looks like the sovereign of the deep. It is crowded with merchants of every nation and its inhabitants are themselves the most eminent merchants in the world. It appears at first not to be the city of any particular people, but to be common to all as the center of their commerce. The vessels in this harbor are so numerous as almost to hide the water in which they float, and the masts look at a distance like a forest. Very nice words, and they really capture the essence of this city, which is sometimes referred to as the Venice of the North, or one of the Venices of the North, because of all its um, importance as being a commercial center and in the Dutch Golden Age, the main port for uh, the Dutch Republic. And some of the sites that we'll hit on tonight are sort of centered here around the, the um, middle, the central part of the city. We include the Rijksmuseum, the Rembrandt House Museum, and then down from here, you have the museum's quarter, you have the uh, Royal Concertgebouw or, or Concert House, and then up here, you've got the Stock Exchange, which is over here on the right-hand side. This is um, one of the oldest in the world. It was established right around the very early 17th century. And this is a Dutch painting showing what it looked like in the mid-17th century. Of the of stock, correct? Um, the, the Dutch East India Company being one of the first sort of publicly traded companies, my understanding. 
That's correct, yes. So it, it holds that uh, distinction in world history. And some of the main sites, one of them uh, that's really quite well known is the Kaisersgracht or the Emperor's Canal, which is the largest, from my understanding, in the city. And here's a picture of the Rijksmuseum here. You also have the Audekerk, Rembrandt House Museum, the Royal Palace, which uh, was formerly the town hall, and the square that it occupies called the Dam, which is a major uh, place for the gathering of people today in Amsterdam. And then here's the Katsergebouw uh, down below. So these are some of the sites we're gonna hit on. So when Rembrandt arrives there in, uh, by, I could believe it's 1630, 1629 or 30, he uh, is really starting to reach the height of his career. And his elder uh, contemporary, Franz Hals, is painting the very wealthy Dutch burghers. And that's what Rembrandt's gonna do. Uh, for example, here with portrait of um, Miss van uh, Kleiberg, for example. And they wanted to represent themselves as very distinguished, very sober. We don't see lots of um, uh, fanciness that's going to change later in the 17th century. How still pays more attention to that. And we have a portrait in our collection, which is a copy um, after Rembrandt's self-portrait as a burger. So he's fashioning himself like many of his patrons. Our painting is done after the original in the Burel collection, part of the Glasgow Museums in Scotland. So you can see how he's trying to fashion himself as one of his patrons and sort of comparing himself to them as a peer, which is quite interesting. And with all this success, what Rembrandt's gonna do is he um, and his wife Saskia are going to buy a very fashionable house um, right in the center of Amsterdam. And um, I will uh, turn that over to Sarah uh, to, talk, to fill you in more about this. Uh, sure. Very interesting site. So um, I'm trying to remember the order of the slides. You can see obviously the big banner there in front. Um, the, to the right of the large banner is the residence of Rembrandt, which be, was a kind of pilgrimage space after his death. Um, people knew about it. And I think it was 1906 that a foundation was finally established to buy the house and to turn it into a sort of um, memorial in a way to Rembrandt, and it was really based on his etchings. So most of his etchings, um, he lived in this house for nearly 20 years from 1639 to 1658 and did most of his etching there. And so they went about assembling a nearly complete collection of the etchings. And so originally it was not really a, a domestic space for people to visit. It was a place to go and see the etchings, um, but that changes. And I'm not sure what slide is next, but um, Daniel will take us through and we'll see. So when he first comes to Amsterdam, it's actually um, 1631. And he is living with um, the cousin of the woman that he ends up marrying, uh, it's Hendrik van Uhlenberg, I believe his name is right there. And uh, he, had, if you look at this, you can see the Rembrandt house with the green shutters, um, red on one side, green on the outside. And next to it is the Rembrandt corner. That actually used to have, a, was a dealer and uh, Rembrandt stayed with him and worked with him for a couple of years, uh, met uh, his beloved Saskia through him. And uh, so while you're seeing Rembrandt house there, it was really the space next to it. Um, that, that I chose for that slide to just be the first couple of years from around 1631 to 1633. Um, Rembrandt's life was really well intimately connected with Uhlenberg. Sometime after he gets involved with Saskia, he really um, breaks away from uh, the commercial relationship with him. Um, you can go up forward, Daniel, and we'll see. Yes, this so, is Saskia, by the way, in this painting. There they are together as Rembrandt raises his glass of beer. So it's a very happy time in their lives. It is. And, and when they finally buy that house. So for a couple of years, they rent a space in this very fashionable neighborhood, which now um, it, it, there were two houses, I guess, side by side on the site of what is now maps and, and Google Google search images on this. And uh, the restaurant is clearly where all the cafe tables are there on the canal. 
And uh, they were there for a couple of years in, in a very nice neighborhood, but he didn't have very much workspace there. So they were looking for uh, another place. And so that's how they ended up purchasing their house, which uh, I think one of the comparisons I read, uh, we're, we'll get to it. Um, th this is just in here for fun to show you what the old town hall in Amsterdam looked like. And uh, Daniel reminded me that this is after an engraving by one of the artists that is actually represented in our print show. I pulled this image, um, not really thinking about that. So I think that I put that there because when that town hall um, is destroyed, you can see uh, Rembrandt went and sketched the ruins. So um, after the fire of 1652, you can see. Um, so before the before image was kind of what the ta old town hall looked like and then Rembrandt going there to the site. And then the new town hall is, is, is something to behold, which we will behold if shortly. <laughs> Here is, um, this is kind of fun, a little bit of following in the footsteps of Rembrandt. So he made a drawing of what was a ruin from the medieval period in Amsterdam's hist history, this tower, the Mantelbahnstorn. And he was probably at around, this is number 31 on, on the street. He was probably down the street a little bit closer to the tower when he made the drawing. But it is really um, kind of fun that one can go on Google Maps and kind of trace the spaces and, and see the spots. And so you see there to the left of the tree in the distance is the tower. Daniel is good at doing handling the zoom. And here's another one where we could kind of um, pretend um, we're walking in Rembrandt's footsteps. And this is the Umval, which is actually a word that means um, downfallen or collapsed, something like that. It's a ruin. Um, there used to be a ruin on, on this site, and it was a place on the outskirts of the city, um, very much more rural um, than Amsterdam itself. And of course, you can see the windmills and the sort of um, more country-like nature of the city in Rembrandt's image from 1645. One thing you can't see very well in this tiny thing is that there are a pair of lovers hidden there on the left under that tree, um, sneaking away um, for some time together. Um, but the umfall still, you know, in the image pulled off of Google, um, Google Maps, um, still is a place where, you know, people go to relax and, and be near the water. And that I should mention that behind the tree, <laughs> not, not very clear in this, and I didn't think it was important enough to do another image, but that is um, a 36 uh, floor office building, which has a little spire on the top that makes it the tallest building apparently in Amsterdam. And it is the Rembrandt Tower. So um, Rembrandt, you know, clearly it, it might have taken some time, but uh, Amsterdam is very proud of Rembrandt. Now we're back to the House Museum, which is where, so they move in in uh, 1639, and I believe it was 13,000 guilders. Uh, my memory might be wrong, but I did a, I, in 2012, the dollars to guilders valuation on that was about $780,000. So, you know, in today's money, even more than that. So this is a really aspirational kind of purchase and, um, Rembrandt really enjoys um, living a, a nice life. He enjoys being able to collect, um, to buy, go down to the ships when they come to harbor and buy curiosities. We'll see some of that, um, to buy the artwork of other artists. Um, he doesn't leave the Netherlands. He is not one of these people that goes off and makes a pilgrimage to Italy. Um, he stays within the bounds of the Netherlands, but he is very well educated in terms of the world based on what comes to the ports of Amsterdam. Um, and he enjoys that. And so he probably is 
you know, going over his head a little bit with a house, uh, with a mortgage this large. And he ends up actually, um, you know, after about 20 years ne needing to declare bankruptcy and sell a lot of the material. It is that bankruptcy inventory that lets the foundation recreate the interiors of the house. So we will look a little at that. The other thing is that, you know, he moves in um, with Saskia and, and they're clearly in love and happy. Um, but I believe it's three out of four children die in infancy in the house. Saskia dies when she is only 29 of probably tuberculosis. Um, they have one son who lives to be a, a pretty young adult. Um, so there is quite a lot of sadness um, in this house, as well as some amazing triumphs in his art career. So I put this in, this is pretty funny. This is a paper doll house that um, I think the Rembrandt house sells. I think it was 23 euros if you're interested in buying and making one. But it gives us an idea of the layout of the house and the cross section. So when you're coming in off the street, you're coming into that black and white tile floor. Um, that first front area would be called the Vorhaus, um, sort of um, you know, the front of the house. And that was often, say, say your husband's not Rembrandt, <laughs> that would often be where the man conducted business and the rest of the domestic sphere was really considered you know the, the woman's world but Rembrandt is a dealer and an artist and you see as you look at this that you know Rembrandt's activities really take up a lot of the space so his studio is on the floor above um, you have his wonderful sort of personal museum his kind of cabinet of curiosities with the, the, the little paper armadillo and and crocodile or alligator or something hanging on the other side, um, representing the exotic collections. And then up on that top floor, you can see on the left, the wheel of the etching press. So this is up where his etching studio was and he would make his etchings. There is a living space um, that is not included in, in this little cross section that we'll see in photographs. Um, the kitchen is the space down at the basement. Um, an interesting thing is that your, the kitchen maid would essentially have lived there. there there's a cabinet bed in the wall so that the kitchen maid could go, you know, go in and sleep. And Rembrandt had students who also you know, would have been residents of the house. So the kitchen maid is almost like taking care of a dormitory in a sense. There's a lot of activity in the kitchen um, and a fire that would be going all day um, and night to, to cook and also for, for warmth. So um, you can move on to the next slide, Danny. This is um, the very small sort of office space that was typically within the front of the house, the Vorhaus, um, where men would do their business. And uh, it's pretty small. And the idea is, you know, folks would come in off the street and you could do your paperwork. Um, it's a little bit like having a shop front in a way because it's there and it's handy for bringing people in and doing whatever kind of transactions. And I think it goes to the transactional, the sort of commerce, the life of commerce um, in Amsterdam at the time. This is a new addition really to Rembrandt House. They just installed this little office area in 2018. And I don't quite understand how it connects to um, the rest of that first floor. Um, my understanding from what I've read about Dutch domestic life is that it would be a pretty small contained area on that floor. And so here is the rest of that floor, which is, is really incredibly, uh, incredibly impressive looking with the black and white tile. Um, this is where Rembrandt would have shown, um, he was a dealer as well as an artist. So he might've had examples of his work there. He might've been working out the details of commission um, could have perhaps, you know, the night watch is painted um, around the, the, this time early in his residence here. So could have been taking the commission for the night watch. Um, he also would have had examples of other artwork there that he would be selling because he was also a dealer. Here's the kitchen. Um, just an, an idea. I, I, another like little nugget of, of sort of arcane information is that um, Pots and pans, I mean, you, we know when we covet like a Le Creuset uh, Dutch oven, how expensive really good cookware can be. Pots and pans were one of the more expensive things that you needed to furnish a household with at the time. And it was often a part of a woman's dowry because um, furnishing uh, all the necessary kitchen equipment could be very expensive. So uh, I loved seeing all the pots and pans here because of that. 
And then this is a sort of, so there are not, not traditional bedrooms in this, um, you know, kind of uh, in, in 17th century Holland domestic spaces. Um, most rooms with a fireplace in them would also have a cabinet bed or sleeping area, because if you had a nice warm room, um, you wanted to take advantage of that for sleeping. So you can see this is this is the living room. They have hung it now um, with a lot of the work of Rembrandt's teacher, Peter Lustman, but there's a, that little cabinet bed over there in the corner. And these are beds that are pretty short. Um, not all beds were short like this, but there was some belief that um, it was actually healthier to have your head raised when you were sleeping. So uh, some people slept in these kind of smaller scale beds. I think we're getting some questions. So Kelly and Jillian can interrupt if they think we should jump on them now. But here's the studio. And so this is the space um, where the night watch would have, you know, he would have been working on it. Um, in the back there, see all the way in the back corner, there's a piece of fabric um, over the window. So this is, I think, a northern exposure, I think I read, and he's controlling the light um, also with this um, sort of scrim that he can raise or lower. And according to the curator there, um, he could actually kind of focus the light. So if you're a Baroque painter and you're trying to get some really dramatic effects with light, um, he was able to do some things to, to make the lighting in his studio more dramatic. Um, I don't think he's quite gonna get his, his chiaroscuro uh, happening in real life, but um, maybe trying to just be able to read the kinds of shadows that, that would be realistic. Yes, absolutely. For he probably would have employed some kind of candlelight or lanterns for some of that. <laughs> yeah. And here's the cabinet room. So um, the, it, again, the inventory from his bankruptcy would have helped the curators here recreate the kinds of objects he would have had. But you can see um, the bus would be, you know, not only sort of examples of, of classical art, but they would be also academic tools if you're teaching other artists um, in terms of uh, drawing and rendering a lot of like exotic things, shells and, uh, you know, stuffed armadillo. <laughs> it seems like there's another armadillo on the floor there. So this yes. incredible, so the Dutch golden age, one of the things we talked about last month is that it, you know, it's a golden age for art, but it's a golden age for science. It's a golden age for exploration. It's a, you know, it's an age that we look back on now with some discomfort because of the colonialism, because of the slave trade, because of the way the wealth was made that doesn't sit comfortably with us today. Um, but it was certainly an age of great curiosity and um, Amsterdam had so much going on. Not the most articulate way of saying it, but it did. Um, and here we are up in the print studio and you can see how the little paper etching press in the dollhouse had the same kind of, uh, of arm on it. Um, and this is also a kind of fun story. They do a lot of workshops there with people can go in and you can see etching demos. And I think you can even, you know, uh, pull a plate yourself, um, you know, on, for some workshops and things. But this etching press is, I think it was built in like 2007 based on 16th century plans. So it is essentially a reproduction of the kind of press that, that Rembrandt would have used. And what's interesting about the process here is when you turn that four pronged wheel, you're gonna use your hand and your foot and you have to be really smooth because you don't want that stopping anywhere on the plate. You want that to be one nice smooth movement um, and takes takes a fair amount of force and leverage. And you see, um, they do have, I think, the most complete um, set of his etchings um, in the world. And you see uh, an example of the three trees there on the left. They often display facsimiles because of the fact that prints are light sensitive, but they also have a number of his um, of his plates. And they talk. There's that little thing above there on the windowsill. I was telling Daniel about this before, where they show you the difference between, so that bottom, in our last conversation, we were talking about dry point. That bottom dark fuzzy area is dry point because you're kicking up the burr 
you're working directly into the plate, but you're not using an the same tool as engraving. You're not like going down deep like you would with an engraving. You're just kind of scraping in and you're kicking up a metal burr and it's gonna hold the ink and it's gonna make it deep and velvety <laughs> like you see, <clears throat> excuse me, on the bottom. That burr is gonna wear down sometimes as soon as 10 prints, um, maximum like 30 prints with a, a in dry point. In the middle there, you see the fine sharp lines of engraving. Sorry, I didn't mean to get this deeply into this, but it is kind of interesting. And on the top, you're seeing etching. And the only thing you can really see here on your computer screens probably that's interesting is that it goes from dark to light, from, from left to right there. Because the example of how long the, the darker, you know, the more ink it's going to retain in the darker. So um, that's kind of fun that they have that there. Daniel, you can move on to the next slide. And this is just a funny image of the way the Rembrandt house was, I think, sort of circa 1908 when they had first opened and they were mainly a print display space as opposed to a domestic space. And Yes, yeah. while Rembrandt's living in that house, uh, it's really interesting to take a, a virtual tour of it. He is creating paintings like this, uh, like the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas uh, Tulp from 1632. We were, Sarah was just mentioning before how important science is. Rembrandt is bringing us into the um, latest developments in science here by showing us this doctor who's teaching his medical students how to dissect the body. And Rembrandt has a tremendous attention to detail. He fully understands the, um, the rendering of the human figures. And here the doctor is uh, showing how the musculature of this man's arm is all put together as the students eagerly look on. And look so at my yes, connection is unstable and I might've missed something uh, you said, Daniel, but I, they, did, they did this once a year. My understanding is that the like, you know, yes. there's one sort of demonstration like this a year. That's right. It was a very special uh, occasion at the time, and um, not not a regular occurrence uh, by any means, as it is um, early modern or pre-modern science. And we come back to this one again, uh, just to show you uh, how how Rembrandt is so self-confident at this time, and you can see the luxurious clothes that he's wearing, and he certainly has a very high budget for living when he's married to Saskia and then they move into their fashionable house. It was very uh, merry and optimistic. And but, kind of wonderful to think about an artist at that time feeling that sort of confident and empowered. I mean, he was a child prodigy and, uh, and I think he got a, a fair amount of support in pursuing art, um, but it's still, um, you know, I, I, I love that he's enjoying himself and, I wish he had a better financial manager, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes, because what's going to come after is going to be difficult. And one of his first major obstacles is this painting called the Night Watch that's in the Rijksmuseum. The Rijksmuseum, as many of you may know, it's one of the great collections of Europe and certainly of um, the Netherlands. And it was founded in the late 18th century, uh, originally in The Hague, and then it was relocated to Amsterdam. And it was founded upon similar principles to as was the, uh, founded with the Louvre in Paris, uh, that it would be a museum for uh, art of not just the, the Dutch tradition, but many other European traditions. And certainly that's the case today. But you can see the Re Rembrandt's Night Watch is so large, it occupies this grand space. And today, um, I believe it is still undergoing restorations that are uh, streamed live on video. And it has its own uh, space here, its own spot. And the painting though, uh, it's, it, it did not go over so well for Rembrandt in terms of his patrons. It basically depicts an outing of a, a militia company. It doesn't play any particular militia role, but they see it as part of their social obligation and duty. Fits in with this whole concept in the Dutch Golden Age of um, burger values. And so the, you have here in the middle, you have the Captain Franz Bonning Kalk, who's really the protagonist of the scene. He wanted a, a portrait of himself and his militia company that looked more like this one that's done by Nicolas Claude in Franz Hals that's on the right and also in the Rijksmuseum. He wanted this really distinguished light to shine on them, to show them at their best, each of their individual personalities of each of the men of the militia company. But that's not what Rembrandt was interested in doing. He wanted to do this chiaroscuro 
um, image that shows this episode happening in action rather than this kind of more staged uh, set of portraits. And so Rembrandt ran in difficulty with this and they didn't, um, they were not happy with the commission and they basically um, rejected it at the time, um, if I'm not mistaken. So 1642 is a turning point here because he runs into this difficulty. Now on a more positive note, what's neat is that in uh, 2006 to commemorate the 400th um, anniversary of Rembrandt, um, of his birthday, the two Russian artists created sculptures, life-size of the different characters from the painting and put it in the Rembrandt square with the statue of the artist. Really very fabulous. They made the picture come alive in 3D uh, form. So that's something really neat. It's bringing it literally out of the museum and into the space of, um, of people, of the public. And the works were actually toured. They went on a tour to several museums at that time. And then they came back and found a home, uh, which I believe is still there. Some so of the other have, sites. We oh, have a raised hand. And sure. I'm wondering if, um, if that's a question. Um, yes, it was a question. Uh, someone wanted to know if Leiden was considered uh, an intellectual hub. Okay, yes, the university was there. It was a center, I believe, of, of sort of humanist um, discourse and philosophy, and Daniel may know more than I do about that. Um, and and the, que the question was it about Amsterdam. I couldn't hear because of the connection. Biden. Oh, Leiden. Yes, it was an intellectual center. It was a center for the study of science, um, also a major publishing center, too, okay. like Amsterdam, the printing of books. So, yes. And you also have uh, the tradition of uh, Protestant religion. Of course, originally the old church in Amsterdam was a Catholic church. It has some late Gothic um, sections of it. But later on, it becomes Calvinist. And often the Dutch would depict the interiors of their churches in paintings like this by Emmanuel de Vita. This is an interior view where there's actually a, um, some excavation going on here with this tomb. And you even have the genre scenes that are pulled into the interior itself of people mm -hmm. going about their business and engaged in daily activities. So tell us a little bit about, um, so this church would have had a much more ornate interior when it was a Catholic church, correct? Yes. It, it yes, would it have. So uh, th there were the, the iconoclast movements in which, you know, some churches were essentially vandalized in, in order to remove what was seen to be extraneous de decoration that distracted from um, real devotion. It was sort of, um, you know, praying to an idol in a sense. Um, so the Calvinists were very strict about that. And um, I don't want to, Saskia is also here, right? This is where Saskia's tomb is. And I think Yes, there is a. I think there is an annual tribute to her that happens, which is kind of sweet. That's correct. Many notable persons in Dutch history are buried in the Oude Kerk, so it's a very important monument. And absolutely, the uh, taking away of anything that might distract from prayer and one's relationship to God would have been stripped out of the church during the conversion to it being a Protestant worship space. Um, and then speaking uh, to the, more of these ideas of Dutch uh, pride, and specifically in commerce, you have what's today the royal palace of the royal Dutch family, but during Rembrandt's day, it was the town hall. And you can see here that it's a very elaborate building that's put up, designed by Jacob van Kampen, who was an architect. And it's here, we're going to go a couple of slides that I want to draw your attention, these two pediments that he does on the east and west facades. And basically, they're elaborate allegories of the commerce of uh, the Dutch Republic. And this is the interior, which is equally elaborate and has sculptural programs done by this artist sculptor. One of the most important um, in the low countries, his name is Artist Quilinus. And here is Artist Quilinus, and he's responsible for these two uh, elaborate pediments that basically represent the um, uh, Dutch commerce here in the center receiving the gifts or the, the uh, the bounty of trade from the four parts of the world, four continents known at that time, um, Africa, Asia, um, America, and also Europe. And then there's a similar theme on this one over here on the other side of the building where Atlas is holding up the globe and it directly connects 
with the imagery down below. And this is just a little engraving of um, artist Quilinus here. And before we move on, I just wanted to point out that this sculptor who did the town hall, his brother is Erasmus Quilinus the Younger. And we have a painting, uh, the, his elder brother, of Christ blessing the children in our museum. And the self-portraits, like with Rembrandt, were very popular at this time. It was how an artist um, promoted oneself. And you can see how artist Quilinus did this through the medium of prints. And his brother Erasmus would have done so similarly. Here he is with his wife and child. I will and say too that this is a time where as as the as portraiture develops through this period you see a little bit more affection and less formality sometimes happening in portraits of married couples and in families uh, uh, marital affection starts to become a little bit more visible yes definitely and it, the self portraits if they are especially family ones they become very enlivened uh, as well but as Rembrandt goes on later in his career, the joy that we saw earlier with Saskia uh, starts to diminish. And that's because he runs into many uh, financial problems, but also the loss of his children. And of course, uh, his wife, um, as Sarah mentioned before, probably dying of tuberculosis. By the time we get to 1658, Rembrandt begins to move into a darker style of painting. And also this is reflected in his prints. And in relation to the town hall, this is what leads to another calamity for him, his commission of the conspir conspiracy of Claudius Civilis. And this is, was a commission from the um, government officials of Amsterdam at the time to decorate the interior of the town hall with scenes that celebrated Dutch history. And in this case, what Rembrandt was charged with doing, as well as two of his contemporaries, was to create a scene of this um, pre-modern uh, figure, his name was Claudius Civilis. He was a member of the original Dutch Batavian tribe, the indigenous peoples. And basically what this guy does is, is he makes his men within his tribe swear an oath that they're going to stage a revolt against the Romans. And that's what they're doing here. He's um, asking his men to please join him in this revolt to th throw off their oppressor. And Rembrandt, uh, he is critiqued heavily for this painting, which I should add was much larger originally. It's been cut down um, because he represents each of these people so humbly. The paint is uh, very thickly applied. It's, there's a strong contrast between light and dark. And the government officials were expecting a very polished history painting, not like what I showed, not unlike what I showed you before with Franz Hals. This is not what they expected at all. This was very avant-garde at the time. And you can see here, he's even shown the blind eye of Claudius Civilis here, invented this um, uh, occurrence here with the oath of the swords, which is not described in the Roman historian Tacitus's account upon which Rembrandt based the painting. So what ends up happening is that Rembrandt's asked to remove his large painting for one of these lunettes that you see here. And he's in tremendous financial difficulty. And very sadly, he has to cut the canvas down and sell pieces of it in order to pay his bills. So it's very tragic for the artist, but it's a remarkable work of art. And um, from there, we're going to um, begin to wrap up the program with a brief look of, at the town of Lauren. Uh, and this is a suburb Lauren of uh, Amsterdam. And it's important to us, we have a Dutch connection because our sister museum, the Singer Lauren Museum is there. Here we have William and Anna Singer who are the founders of our museum in Hagerstown. But in 1956, after William's death, she's gonna found a second museum in Lauren and attached to it will be a concert hall. So basically the singers have a home. I'll show you some photos after called uh, the Villa of the Wild Swans. They moved there in 1902 to Lauren and William uh, begins to paint. He works in an impressionist style. And William and Anna met each other um, in the United States. William was from Pittsburgh and Anna Singer was from Hagerstown, Maryland. And they marry one another and they move permanently to Europe where they divide their time between the Netherlands and Norway. But William becomes friends with artists who are part of this Dutch colony in Lauren, namely Anton Malva, Jakob Doyevard, who's their friend, a man named Josef Israels, who's also a landscapist, and then Max Lieberman, the German Impressionist. And these are some photos of the singer Lauren in the attached concert hall 
from the time that it opened. And our museum had an exchange exhibition with the singer Lauren in 2006-7 uh, as part of the celebration of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts 75th anniversary. So this was really part of the singer's legacy. They loved art. Uh, they also loved music. And here are some photos of uh, showing some of William's paintings as well as these Lauren artists displayed in the original galleries. And the, the view of the wild swans is really quite um, beautiful. And it's in a remarkable uh, state of preservation. They still have some of the rooms um, from what I understand, though I haven't been there. This is how it would have looked originally though, uh, with all of the singer's furnishings. They not only liked paintings, but they also collected decorative arts. This shows the villa under construction in 1911, 1912. And you can still visit it today. This shows William's studio within the villa and uh, shows how he's displayed these paintings. And I should point out, note how the interior windows are not unlike those that we saw in the Rembrandt house. And the singers were very much attracted to Dutch culture and led them to become permanent expatriates. And this is a particularly nice shot of the main living room there at the Villa of the Wild Swans. It's called that because there are so many swans that um, fly by there and nest near in the area. As you can see, the singers had tapestries, they had late Renaissance furniture, and other um, decorative works, including Asian art too. And here are some of the uh, interiors as they appeared at the time. It's very fascinating to see how they lived. But as their art collection grew, the singers would uh, sort of outgrow uh, the Villa of the Wild Swans and they, would, they bought another property called the Villa Naderheim in 1937. And they would move in there for a period of time William will die, I believe it's 1944 or 45. And then so Anna will relocate again back to Lara, uh, Lara. This is Blaricum is very close by. So uh, we very much have a connection at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts with this tradition of uh, Dutch art, though from a later period uh, in the 19th to mid 20th centuries. So it's a uh, makes a sort of a nice uh, circle from where we started at the beginning. And I'm um, not sure if we have uh, any questions um, of, that relate to this, but uh, feel free to jump in, Sarah, if you have anything you'd like to add. I just, you know, what, it, what has struck me the most is completely tangential, but it was just talking about images of marital affection. And I love that photograph of, of uh, William and Anna. And I always yes. think of Billy because that's what she calls them in all the correspondence. That's right. And they really did have this um, affection for one another. And it's a photo I really like to include. And it's also really neat to look at these photos because it speaks to the singer's uh, worldly vision. And that's one of those are among the principles on which our museum in Hagerstown is founded. That is the collection and representation, not only of European and American artists, but art from all over the world. In, in this photograph, you can see some of the Asian art objects that are in here next to their paintings. And then the, I believe these are the wise and foolish virgins, which are today displayed outside our singer gallery. That's, that's really wonderful, yeah. Fun. Yes. No, yeah. It, it, it gives you a sense um, of, li of living with art, the, you know, the, the comfort of their home and the enrichment of, of all of these, you know, various, art and artifacts. Um, I think we can all sort of imagine ourselves curled up with a book on one of those sofas. Yes, absolutely. So um, one other thing to mention about the, just to sort of place William in a little bit more context, I'll go back a couple of slides. He, he and his contemporaries sort of continue in the tradition of looking at Dutch life, although Really, the Lauren School is influenced by trends in Impressionism, French Impressionism, if you want to call it international Impressionism, certainly for William, who for his entire career paints in this um, uh, pointillist style that, in which he uses a very bright palette of pastels. And this is a, a very serene landscape that he did not far from Lauren in a place called Kampen though his Dutch landscapes are fewer than his of Norway because his real love was Norway. But you also have artists like 
Anton Malva too. I was gonna say you still get that flat, that Dutch horizon, that uh, big sky, and you know sort of flatness that you get in um, a Dutch painting. There is one technical question here. Um, if appropriate, can you explain the technique of tenebrism and contrast to chiaroscuro? Yes. Um, let me go back to um, one here. Right, You have a little bit of it going here, though more in the night watch, if I were to go all the way back. But tenebrism is basically very uh, developed, very exaggerated chiaroscuro. And it is oftentimes associated with the Italian artist Caravaggio who develops it. And there's no doubt that Rembrandt was very connected to this. But what it uh, refers to in Italian, uh, tenebr tenebroso means it's, it's, it's shaded, it's in shadows. It comes from the Latin word tenebrae, which means shade or shadow. And Rembrandt was very much familiar with this. And in works like The Night Watch or The Conspiracy of Claudius Civilis, what he's doing is he's creating these areas where the light really contrasts with the darker areas that he's painted. And the light, in many of these paintings using that technique seems to emanate from within. Sometimes though in the Italian tradition, it comes in from the side, for example, as if it were a theater sta a stage. Very dramatic. But right. by today's uh, standards, what, whereas his critics at the time really reacted to this painting, uh, negatively we see it today as quite a masterpiece. And so what about um, the night watch in terms of tenebrism? Do you see any examples there? Yes, you could see it here in his self-portrait, the late one. And let's go back. In the night watch, we can see it in a lot of areas. See the contrast between the light and the dark. It's tough to see here. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. These guys from the militia company are outside of a municipal building. See the column here? and then you have the cornice. They're, they're just coming out of the building. And that's where you have the, the tenebrism. You have the dark, almost blacks here that he's used. And he's contrasted with, it, with all the finery of the officer's costumes. And then look at the light shining down on, the, on this little personification or mascot of their company. That's how it's being worked to effect. Or this figure's leg totally shaded here against the light shining down on the, on the young woman or, or mascot. It's, it's really exploiting the illusionistic properties of painting um, and telling lies. <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's creating really, really, really convincing lies. <laughs> yes, as, as art is, is um, always an illusion, particularly this type. Well, I, did you have anything else, Daniel? Are we at the end of our slideshow? I think we've done our little, just about an hour. Yes, and we reached the end of the- um, So the um, I, we'll, I'll just speak for a moment. And if anybody has any last questions that they can type them in the chat, but um, this was really fun. Um, if you missed the last one and wanna get more into the Dutch golden age, you can certainly go back and look at it. Um, we have the two other programs that I mentioned coming up. Um, Daniel's going to give a sort of, um, you know, virtual walkthrough of the show um, sometime the week of January 3rd. And when I say that, I mean, he's not going to be in the gallery. He'll do a PowerPoint, but he will take us through as though, um, as though we were walking in a way. Um, and then uh, January, what did I say the date was of the next Let's Talk Art? Jan I believe January 6th or 7th, Sarah. Is when you're going to do your thing. And then and I think it's well. January 19th. For yeah, next. written down here. Yes, January 19th at six is our Zoom salon. And uh, I am always appreciative of Jillian and Kelly who stand by here to um, help us uh, vet questions and deal with any emergency technical things that may happen. I'm always happy to um, the internet connection for being stable for a night because I have had times when we've been doing this and my connection is completely dropped out. So <laughs> I thank you all for being with us. Um, I thank you, Daniel, for uh, also uh, being so flexible that you're willing to, to talk and be interrupted. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, many thanks to you as well and to everybody for joining us. It's great to be able to share our insights about this period and about Holland with you.
there's Jillian and Kelly. Good night, everybody. And thank you so much for being with us. And um, the museum is open. The show is fabulous. You know, wear your mask, come and see us. Um, you know, we're there sometimes. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to do our best to prevent um, any spread of the virus. We want to keep the museum open. We want it to be safe for, for people. So I won't encourage socializing, but I will encourage um, contemplating the art. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Oh, Carson, someone has offered this cocktail. Well, it looks much too exciting for something this early in the evening. What do you think, Carson? Best to avoid it, my lady. Yes, best to avoid it. But what we must not avoid, Carson, are the amazing tablescapes at the museum this year. They will begin in February and they may be accessed, if I may check my card, at www wcmfa.org. Very good, Mary. Thank you. They will be shown online this year. Mm. Online, Carson, whatever that is. Nice, yes. It's as wild as that. Let me try it.